Bratton, Brown. Uh, a quorum is established. Um, Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, when I call your name, I will call your name as well as the name of the sponsoring senator. Uh, you'll both come forward. You'll stand behind uh, the presenting dais right in front of us. Harrison, our photographer, will uh, take a picture of you. If you have family here that you want to be with you uh, for the picture, they can come up at that point. You'll sit down. The, the sponsoring senator will uh, give his spiel. You guys can speak, answer any questions. When you're done, for the sponsoring senators, go over and see Mark. Um, the bearded guy, and um, and uh, sign sign a document for us. Uh, so we will uh, begin today with uh, Michelle Minx as a member of the Board of Nursing Home Administrators, Senator Crawford. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Sandy Crawford, District 28. It's my pleasure this morning to present to you and sponsor Michelle Minks for the Board of Nursing Home Administrators. I've known Shelly for a long time. You can call her Shelly instead of Michelle. I've known her for a long time, seen her in action. She uh, ran a facility herself. She spent her entire career in health care, and as I said, she served as an administrator for several years. She holds an MBA from SBU in Healthcare Administration. I can think of no better person to serve on this board than Shelley. I'm sure she can answer any question you may have. Thank you, Senator. Ms. Minks, good to have you with us. Questions for uh, this appointee? Senator Moon. Good morning, Ms. Minks. Good morning. Thanks for your willingness to serve. Um, I have some in-laws in a nursing home, and uh, I think it's probably pretty well run. Uh, and I think they have pretty good care. In your view, what is the biggest need in the nursing home industry today? Funding. Funding. And um, I, I, I imagine that there are a lot of folks who work there do it because they really uh, love old, older people. And uh, so what kind of funding are you looking at? Uh, and I'm sure they'd like that to have that too. I think funding for, um, especially in the Medicaid population, that seems to be the nursing homes that are struggling the most, as well as assisted living's residential cares. I haven't visited uh, that large number of facilities, but do you suppose, uh, in your opinion, most of them are uh, up to date as far as uh, the uh, the housing and all that and uh, the uh, uh, the facilities in general, or are there a lot of repairs that are needed, or is there a big overhaul that you think uh, needs to happen? I think that um, some of them obviously could use some overhauls, but we do have the Department of Health and Senior Services that is providing the regulation for them, and they have set those regulations, and each year or every two years when they're done, their survey's done, I mean, they're obviously meeting those, or they're getting cited and have to fix them immediately. Yeah. And I saw when you came up to the witness table that uh, there were several with you. Are those family members? Uh, family members, and then actually my um, boss that I work for. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking maybe your family members are treating them well, so they'll treat you well later. Maybe? That's the hope. That's <laughs> yeah, the good. hope. <laughs> good. Well, thank you for being willing to take this, this job on, and I wish you well. Thank you very much. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Thanks for your willingness to serve. Uh, next up, we will hear Sarah Newell uh, as a member of the Missouri 911 Service Board, also Senator Crawford.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Sandy Crawford, District 28. Uh, also here today to present to you Sarah Newell for the Missouri 911 Service Board. So when I have 911 questions, this is my go-to person. I've been to Sarah's facility in Polk County. She runs a top-notch facility. The thing I really love about Sarah is she started as a dispatcher, and she worked her way up from dispatching to, to being the administrator or the director, I should say. She was also elected as or sele selected as the 2021 Director of the Year for st the state of Missouri. Uh, and so really proud of that, really proud of her. She, the facility that she runs is uh, fantastic, and uh, you can tell the people love to work for her, and I couldn't be more proud to sponsor her this morning. Thank you, Senator. Questions for Ms. Newell? Senator Mann. Good morning, Ms. Newell. Good morning. Uh, and Looking at the members on the, the current board, it looks like there are eight vacancies out of 15 spots. Correct. Um, are you able to conduct any business yes. without a quorum? Uh, yeah, actually recently we've been able to have a quorum the last several months since these appointments were made. Mm -hmm. um, so we are doing great work um, and there's some things moving forward um, now that was stagnant for a little bit because of those vacant seats. But mm -hmm. since those have been filled, we've had enough for a quorum to do business. Are there a lot of challenges uh, with all the new technological changes, or is that helping you in that Both, double-edged sword. A um, yeah. lot of good things that come with it as far as location and finding people um, in quick manner, uh, but then technology comes with it, so it's updates and it's ever-changing, um, so we just have to stay with it. But there's some really good technology coming out. It's just all about funding to be able to get those agencies to be able to afford those kind of tools. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Further questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Uh, next up we will hear Lacey Brumley as a member of the Missouri Board of Occupational Therapy. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, for allowing us to be here today. I am here, uh, for the record, um, Senator Justin Brown representing the 16th District. Uh, I'm here today to present Lacey Brumley. Lacey's from my hometown in Rolla. She's been appointed to the Missouri Board of Occupational Therapy. Uh, she is currently with uh, Center Well Home Health as a certified occupational therapist assistant, and she graduated from East Central College. And with that, we will entertain any questions. Questions, Ms. Brumley. Senator Moon. <laughs> Mr. Brumley, um, what, what is your vision of uh, what the board can do as it relates to occupational therapy? Tell me about what, uh, what the board actually does. Um, I have been with the board very, very briefly. So um, I know that we're kind of making sure that things are upheld, that we have quality um, th um, clinicians out and about in the field. Um, I'm not sure as, as far as the vision goes. Again, very, very uh, new to the position, but I'm um, hoping to um, just uphold those same qualities that they have already kind of put in place. Um, it has been nine years. Nine years, good, okay. And uh, I, I guess in, in your time, did they go to the doctoral level? in that time since you graduated? What's it, the doctoral? Uh, yeah. I don't believe so. Okay. I think master's is what's still required for okay. a therapist. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. For the questions from Ms. Brumley. Seeing none. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for your willingness to serve. Uh, next up we will hear Galen Erickson, Republican, as a member of the Missouri Veterinary Medical Board. Senator Searpoint. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Mike Serpoint from the 8th Senate District in Jackson County. Dr. Erickson was born in Kansas and attended the Kansas State University where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics and a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree. 
Galen earned licenses in five states while serving with the United States Air Force in Anchorage, Alaska. After, after leaving the Air Force, he and his wife settled in Blue Springs, Missouri. They have been community advocates for church, so school, and community services. Galen and his wife Evelyn are proud of their 50-year marriage. They have two grandchildren, I'm sorry, two children and four grandchildren. Dr. Erickson opened a small animal practice for many years. He has been a, an associate veterinar veterinarian and an active relief veterinarian, serving many practices in Kansas and Missouri. He is currently serving as a council member and mayor pro tem of the Blue Springs City Council. Galen is humbled to be appointed to the Missouri Veterinary Medical Board, looks forward to his role as an advocate to excellence in veterinary medicine. Senator, did I hear that the, uh, the, 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 at the beginning he graduated from Kansas State University? As I read that, I thought I should not have added no. that. No, well, Kansas State, correct? Uh -huh. the, the state is a very important component in that particular <laughs> title, so appreciate that. Uh, questions for uh, this nominee? Senator Ben. Uh, doctor, what caused you to uh, go into the small animal field as opposed to the large animal? I grew up on the farm. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> my mentors at Kansas State uh -huh. pushed me in the direction of small animal. Okay. Uh, I did not want to go back to the farmland. Uh -huh. uh, I was I was in uh, school during Vietnam, yeah. and my, I wasn't sure where I was going to go. There was a lot of uncertainty at that point in time, and the small animal interested me more than large animal. Yeah. I was wondering if it, it might sway you if someone were raising a, a small frame animal uh, on the cattle in the cattle breed if that would maybe bring you back in would that be something you'd practice on if I had if I were <laughs> working on the pygmy goats and the small <laughs> horses and you know they're cute yeah right. but there's a lot there's so much information that I would have to go back to learn there's the yeah species are so different certainly yeah well thank you for your interest in serving and I wish You're you welcome. well thank you for the questions for Mr. Erickson Seeing that. Thank you for being here today. Uh, next up, we will hear Corey Baumgars as a member of the Missouri Wine and Grape Board. I will uh, sponsor, and Senator Lichtmeyer will take the chair. Senator Rowden, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pleasure to be here today before you to um, present Corey Baumgars as a member of the Missouri Wine and Grape Board. Mr. Baumgars currently serves as the president of the Missouri Vintners, Asso Vintners Association, vice president of the winery operations at Le Bourgeois Winery in Rocheport. He serves on the Midwest Grape and Wine Conference Advisory Committee, has previously served on the Ozark Mountain Vineyard Sustainability Assessment Workbook Technical Advisory Committee and has worked in the wine industry for over 30 years. Uh, he's a part owner uh, of Le Bourgeois, and if you've never been there, it is a uh, tremendous uh, gem in the middle of mid-Missouri. Uh, and if you have not, you should, uh, you should uh, take the time to go eat and drink uh, in uh, beautiful Rocheport, Missouri. I'll be, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baumgars, for being here. Uh, I have been a, a, a frequenter of your establishment, and I concur in Senator Rowden's recommendation that, that people is, uh, have not been there. Yet, so. uh, any uh, questions for the nominee? Senator Moon. Thank you. Um, Mr. Baumgard, uh your name, when I saw it, rings a bell. And the first thing I thought that came to mind was Orshelins. Uh, and or, is there any relation? But Baumgars, uh, There's the a small relation. Farm stores? So okay. The, how the story goes is my great-grandfather and that other line of Baumgars' great-grandfather were cousins. Uh. And during the pro, during that prohibition, sorry, it's my business, during the <laughs> Depression, um, my lineage kept their farm. Their lineage ended up selling their farm and all their assets and ended up making a lot of money. So um, they made millions um, we made, you know, a fair amount of farming. So, <laughs> yes. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions for the nominee? Seeing none, thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, 
Uh, next up, we will hear Kayla Hahn, a Republican, as a member of the Public Service Commission. Senator Bernsketter. <clears throat> right there. All right. As long as we can see everybody. There we go. That's good. Uh, why don't the gentleman come this side of the senator? Okay. That looks pretty good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Like the chairman said, my name is Mike Bernsketter, uh, presenting uh, Ms. Kayla Hahn this morning. Uh, she received her PhD and master's in political science from the University of Missouri Columbia with her undergrad from Missouri State University. Uh, she actually worked for the Missouri Senate as assistant director of research and also a research analyst from 2013 to 2018 and then she served uh, most recently as the policy director for the Governor Parson since 2018 till June of 2023 and then she was appointed to the Public Service Commission Public Service Commission in June and she has been an asset ever since she's got there and I she will continue to be an asset once approved by this committee and the whole body and she'd be happy to answer any questions Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Caitlin, for being here today. Uh, I, as you know, there have been um, a lot of, uh, um, there's been some back and forth between the legislature and the PSC, and I, I think more broadly just um, concerns that, that um, folks within our body have about utility costs, the interaction of, um, you know, companies with the PSC, et cetera. I just want to give you a chance to uh, talk about that. Um, talk about your vision for um, you know your service there and how you think you can be an asset in in uh, bridging the gap, which I think on what I think will be you know uh, some um, uh, some big issues over the course of the next couple of years. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you for the question. Uh, I appreciate the committee's time today. Um, the commission is charged with ensuring safe and adequate service at just and reasonable rates, and. Uh, that's a big job. There's a lot of components to go, that go into that job, whether that's, you know, making sure the lights come on. We really need to make sure that we're investing in our infrastructure so that those things can happen. On the balance, we have to make sure that um, when we do make those investments that, uh, you know, it does not lead to rate shock, that we look out for our customers and our consumers to ensure that you know those rates are still affordable and reasonable for them and you know ensuring that we have programs there for those that um, have a hard time with with affording those utility costs since I've been at the Commission I feel like I have already engaged with legislators and stakeholder groups to start working toward um, particular policy goals um, building bridges maybe where they might not have existed previously um, you know there are lots of thing, uh, themes that have been pervasive over time when you talk about utility regulation yeah, you know regulatory lag for example um, and I think that looking at things differently you don't always have have to come to the General Assembly sometimes you can uh, talk with stakeholders to work things out ahead uh, I think I've taken positive uh, steps to do that already, and I look forward to engaging in doing that uh, with with members of the General Assembly and other stakeholders this session and in the future. Great, thank you. Okay. Further questions, Senator Lukemeyer. Uh Thank you, Kayla, for being here. First of all, I just want to say I appreciated the conversation that we had. I think during the veto session whenever you came by. Uh, and one of the things that I was struck with that I actually didn't know about your background is your experience with regulated utilities prior to coming to the governor's office and, and some expertise I think that you bring to the table that maybe um, some prior appointees may not have had as robust of experience in that arena. I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit for the committee. Sure, uh, thank you. Previously, uh, I did work in the Missouri Senate in the Division of Research. Uh, it was my first job out of graduate school. I started February 1st of 2013, and as you know, February is in session. And so um, my very first hearing uh, ever 
was Senate Bill 207. And Senate Bill 207 was electric estrus. And the line for the Senate lounge uh, for the hearing started at forming at 1 o'clock, but the hearing was not until 3 o'clock that day. And so um, that was my very first formative experience. But what I learned over the course of years is, you know, there are they're very nuanced policy positions. And so I got to be front and center to witnessing uh, great debates about, you know, investments versus cost um, and recovery. And so um, in doing, you know, and being part of that, writing a lot of the language for the, for the provisions that passed um, or didn't pass, uh, I learned a lot. I learned about the dealings at the commission, the you know the daily dealing, the daily uh, decisions the commission makes. So when I joined the commission, it really was not um, maybe as much of a learning curve as it could have been. And so I'm really thankful for that experience, uh, you know, staffing the senators uh, because I was able to learn a lot of the policy items that that I now work with on a daily basis. Senator Mosley. Hi. Um, you mentioned programs that you all have for people who have trouble paying the, um, the increased rates. What programs are they? And how do you make sure the constituents know about these programs? That's a great question. There's actually a host of programs across several departments, and uh, there are utility specific programs. Um, for example, the one that you're probably most familiar with is LIHEAP which is actually administered by our community action agencies through the Department of Social Services. There's also LIWAP, which is Low Income Weather Assistance Program, and typically that's administered by Department of Natural Resources. And then we also have programs that each utility has individually uh, within their regulated tariffs to help depending upon the need. So there's, there's a bevy of programs out there. Uh, for the question. Right, right. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, do you all do anything to actively let constituents know about these programs or about these or agencies that help with these programs? Uh, absolutely. I think even last week, our utilities actually kind of take it upon themselves and the Office of Public Counsel to advertise those programs. So there are multiple press releases and social media posts about those programs. Senator Esslinger, then Senator Bean. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to make a comment that I, I'm really, really excited about your opportunities with this board. And I know that you and I have had chances to work together uh, since day one when I came into the chamber of the Senate. And just your, your depth of knowledge in this field, plus just your responsiveness and professionalism, I truly appreciate. And I look forward to what you're going to do with this board. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator. Senator Bean. Thank you for being here today. and. Uh, you know, it's great to have somebody that uh, understands rural America, too, with some roots back to Shannon County, so I appreciate that very much. Um, you know, kind of building off what Senator Luchtemeyer said, uh, have you ever, I mean, when I came into the Senate, utility legislation is some of most, you know, it's, uh, it's very comprehensive and it's uh, very hard for somebody like me to sometimes understand. Have you ever directly been involved with any writing, any legislation? And maybe you could talk about that if you have, so. Uh, yes, Senator, a uh, great question. Um, from 2013 to 2018, I drafted every single piece of utility legislation that came th before the Senate. Um, I think probably one of the most impactful pieces of legislation that I um, worked on was the bill that passed at the end. During that time, there was what I'm just going to refer to as, you know, the energy wars. So there were not a lot of um, pieces of utility legislation passing. And because of that, um, there's a high level of saliency of you know, utility policy in, in the chamber. People had entrenched views, they had reasons for those views, and I had the benefit of learning um, every view from every angle and, and drafting every policy from every angle. And so um, I soaked that up. And um, my last year was kind of what, oh, watershed moment, I would say, in, uh, in Pills Passing. And in February, there was a 27-hour filibuster, and I was in the middle of that. Um, so um, 
you know, when senators had particular things they wanted in, um, I was responsible for making sure that those were written properly um, and, and resulted in a good product for them. Well, once again, just thank you for willingness to serve. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Or afternoon, I think, or morning still. I just wanted to say, um, Dr. Hahn, thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, I think we sometimes don't think about the commitment that these capacities require. And for those that are familiar with you, like our office, working very close together on a lot of different pieces of legislation, a lot of different policy issues, you also did that as a mom and uh, became a new mom to your second child during that process and just to see how you just still took work very seriously while still being able to balance that at home. I think sometimes we really undermine just some of the things that everyone in this room has to balance at home and still do their job at a high level. So I'm excited to see you in this capacity and uh, again, just thank you for the hard work that you've committed so far, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you bring in the future. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. For the question, Senator Moon. Dr. Hahn, you came to my office at least twice, I think, and on other occasions as well. And I guess I'm kind of slow in putting things together. Um, when you had your uh, group accompany you today, there was someone standing to your extreme right, and I thought, oh, my goodness. Is that enough for disqualification? So maybe we could just have her separated out, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, you know, I really never put you guys together, but anyway, uh, I'm sure it'll all work out. It's not the first time. <laughs> Senator Rizzo. Sure. I, I'll be brief, Kayla. I, I, I think a lot of my questions are already answered and so forth, but I'm excited for you to uh, get started over there or you continue your work over there. Um, you know, one thing that she failed to mention, or, or I think Mr. Senator Bean failed to mention, was after that 27-hour filibuster that you were part of, she was back from maternity leave for about 10 minutes uh, when she had to sit there for 27 hours on the Senate floor while people like us bloviated about one thing or another that most of them didn't know half of what she knew sitting at the analyst table about the utility rates and what they were arguing. So. I'm grateful that you are going to be able to serve, uh, uh, and I know you're going to do a fantastic job. Um, I, I think that uh, Senator Laughlin has some questions, and I, obviously her and I have shared a lot of the same concerns about what's going on with the PSC, but I couldn't think of a better person to be a uh, translator to the PSC as to how the Senate works, uh, the people in it, and uh, their perspective. So um, uh, thank you for serving, and uh, I hope we can get this done quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Uh, next up, we will hear Dr. Doug Michael Burgess as a member of the Drug Utilization Review Board, Senator Lutemeyer. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee for the record, Tony Luchtemeyer representing the 34th Senatorial District here today to introduce Dr. Douglas Burgess. Dr. Burgess has been appointed by the governor to the Drug Utilization Review Board. He is a graduate from the Medical University of South Carolina and is board certified in general and addiction psychiatry by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Currently, Dr. Burgess is employed as the medical director of addiction services with the University Health Physicians and also serves as an associate professor of psychiatry at UMKC. Additionally, in 2021, he received the UMKC Gold Humanism Honor Society Award and the UMKC Psychiatry Residency Teacher of the Year Award. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator. Questions for Mr. Burgess? Dr. Burgess. Senator Moon. To uh, commit time to this uh, uh, utility or um, review board. I, I noticed on the members, uh, it looks like there are 14 appointed or 10 appointed. There's 13 total, but there's nine vacancies or expired terms. Will that affect your ability to 
uh, do effective work? Um, yeah, I, I think um, when you look at, so the board uh, is um, tasked with reviewing um, all of the pharmacology that the uh, Missouri or um, the Mo Health Net, um, their Medicaid services. And so when you think about the scope of the services there, it really does help to have um, individuals with expertise in different areas that can kind of understand some of the nuances. Um, it's you know been years since I worked uh, in, uh, with medications for things like oncology and, and some of those things. So having vacancies on those boards can, I, I think, w would be a detriment overall. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think filling those important well even with that impediment I wish you well and I, so your uh, specialty is mental health yes um, and but um, I would imagine because of the uh, uh, the numbers that are missing you'll have to expand your expertise a little bit and cover all those those bases yeah so I, I think um, uh, the um, director uh, Josh Moore um, he does a great job of um, getting experts and, and uh, getting us information on the things ahead of time so we can review them and do as much research as possible so we can make informed uh, uh, decisions and have good discussions. And, and wh what, once you gather all the information, what happens to that? Wh where does that go? So um, I've actually only sat in on one uh, meeting so far, and so um, that it was fortunate most of the things that were presented were related to um, uh, mental health edits, um, and so they basically review what medications are currently covered in the formulary and where new medications or medications that are potentially going to be covered, where they would fit into that, and if there are going to be prior authorizations or um, information that uh, the um, uh, Medicaid would want to review before they would authorize coverage of those medications. So um, it's sort of figuring out where they fit into the algorithm. Um, and most of the things, that I think Medicaid does a good job of covering medications that have a specific indication are superior in some way, and they, most of the things we're just getting added to the, what's currently covered. Thank you. Yeah. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Thanks for being willing to serve. Uh, next up, we will hear Megan Price as a member of the Missouri Workforce Development Board. Senator May. I begin some in-house rules next time I need to be first on the list <laughs> Senator I think we've established in this place that all you got to do is ask and right. the communication is helpful in this uh, in this particular joint <laughs> <laughs> well good morning mr. chairman and members of the committee for the record I am Senator Carla May representing the fourth senatorial district for the state of Missouri it is my pleasure today to introduce mrs. Megan Price to the committee as a nominee to the Missouri's Workforce Development Board. Some of you may remember Megan from her work in former Senator Jill Shoup's office as her chief of staff, a post she held for five years. During those years in the legislature, Megan collected an impressive resume, which included sh shepherding several bills and budget items, working with various stakeholders on legislation, and coordinating community resource events as well as health care fairs. Throughout her career, Megan has consistently shown commitment to creating pathways for professional success, advocating for inclusive practices, and champion initiatives that bridge the gap between education and employment. Her strategic vision and innovative approach earned her recognition as one of the Missouri Times 30 Under 30 honorees in 2020. Currently, in her role as the Executive Director of the Missouri Works Initiative, Megan has had the opportunity to oversee several workforce development programs, including the pre-apprenticeship construction programs in Kansas City, St. Louis, and Springfield, the Disco Dislocated Worker Program, and the Worker Wellness Program. This prior experience, as well as her proven track record as a leader, 
with the necessary with the necessary initiative to get work done makes Megan an excellent nomination to the Missouri Workforce Development Board. I am happy to bring her before the committee today, and I am very excited to see the great work that she's doing continue for our state. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Senator. Question, um, Megan, good to, good to have you here. I just will have one question, and then I'll turn it over to Senator Rizzo. I'm sure this is all going to be very serious. Uh, your, your current employment, tell us a little bit about that. I'd be happy to. Thank you, Senator. Um, so I am the executive director of the Missouri Works Initiative, which is the workforce development arm of the Missouri AFL-CIO. So we deploy workforce development programs um, throughout the state in the sectors including construction, healthcare, um, advanced manufacturing, and um, to in order to get Missourians into gainful and family sustaining jobs so that we can help meet the moment for the infrastructure investments that have been um, made in our state and to help to help our state grow and to help families thrive. So who is your boss, technically? <laughs> Well, I answered to a board okay. who, and the chair of that board is uh, Mr. Jake Hubble in the back. So I have the delight of working for an, an excellent team. And What's group. that experience like? You know, <laughs> it's nothing but fun. I, I don't even think that was honest, but I'll let it go. <laughs> Senator, Senator Rizzo. Well, I would start off by saying I think Senator May should introduce everybody after that introduction. I would probably vote for Donald Trump after that. <laughs> Just, a lot. Uh, uh, having said that, I am I am very grateful that you're going to be uh, hopefully serving on this board. Or I, have you started? Or I don't know if you were uh, in the interim or not. But in any regard, you're going to be a great addition to that board, in spite of uh, your boss's probably terrible advice, <laughs> and who uh, uh, I'm sure does nothing but try to stifle your creativity. Um, but we have actually had the opportunity to work together on uh, some stuff in Kansas City and getting people put in the right place to find jobs and do apprentice programs and things like that. And truthfully, you, you guys are doing a really good job uh, at the AFL over there with getting people into jobs and positions that they otherwise wouldn't have if not for your guys' hard work. So um, in spite of your, your, your boss's lackluster um, uh, attempt to lobby us to get you through, um, we're going to do our best. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator. <laughs> Real questions for this nominee, Senator Williams. I don't have a question. I just want to say congratulations and looking forward to seeing what you do in this capacity. And um, I'm going to leave Jake Hummel alone today. <laughs> he's, a, he's a new dad like me, so I'm going to leave him alone. But uh, congratulations, and I'm looking forward to working together and learning more about what you're doing in this capacity. I appreciate it. It is an honor to continue while, yeah. serving. Further questions for Ms. Price? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Thanks for your willingness to serve. Uh, next up, we will hear Dr. Next up is uh, Dr. Dieter James Duff as a member of the uh, Corner Standards and Training Commission. Senator Moon. Good morning, committee. This is uh, Mike Moon. I represent the 29th Senatorial District, and I have here today uh, Dr. Dieter James Duff, who is a pathologist, and uh, he's here to be presented uh, to get our confirmation to serve on the Corner Standards and Training Commission. If you look through his uh, curriculum vitae, it's uh, filled with lots of stuff. During our brief conversation this morning, I was um, interested to hear how he uh, got to where he was because. Um, he, he admitted to me that he'd never watched CSI, which I thought was kind of kind of strange with the work he's doing. Uh, he briefly uh, led me through some of the uh, the things that uh, coroners do, and um, 
I'd like for him, if you would be willing to ask a question of him about some of those things, uh, I think it'd be good to hear from him. But uh, again, looking through his, um, his experience, he's written several publications, abstracts, he's been on lots of different boards, um, spoken to a lot of folks uh, about his work. And his desire, I believe, uh, well, I, I should let him say that, but um, coroners don't really have to know a whole lot, apparently. And so that's why uh, I think what he's doing on the, to be on the Coroner Standards and Training Commission would be a, uh, a step up. And so um, maybe you'll have some questions, but I present to you uh, Dr. Dieter James Duff. Thank you, Senator Moon. Um, I have two questions. One, can you give us any insight as to how your name came about? I think you have an amazingly cool name, and I'm just be, I'd be curious if there was any story behind it. I was, it's not a family name. Okay. It was named after uh, a co-worker of my father's at, at Regional Hospital in Columbia. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, I'll, I'll assume the role of Senator Moon in this particular instance. Tell us a little bit about your vision for your service on the board uh, and maybe some challenges slash opportunities that you see in the field over the next uh, maybe five to ten years. Well, Missouri has a hybrid system of medical examiners and coroners. Coroners are elected officials and medical examiners are in the larger counties appointed by county commissions and a medical examiner is a physician. A coroner does not have to have medical training or investigative experience in the background and in Missouri there's there's some variability. There are many experienced coroners and there are some that are less experienced and the coroner standards and training commission is setting out to establish training standards to uh, help train coroners before they take office and then provide education af after they've taken office to improve the, the death investigation uh, quality in the state of Missouri. All right, thank you. Further questions for Mr. Duff? Dr. Duff. Seeing none. Thank you for being here today. Uh, next up we will hear Amy Stark as a member of the Missouri Board of Occupational Therapy, also Senator Moon. Good morning again, committee. My name is Mike Moon. I represent the 29th Senatorial District. I'm here today to present Dr. Amy Stark uh, as a appointee to the Missouri Board of Occupational Therapy. Again, um, as with uh, the previous um, appointee, her curriculum vitae, vitae is, is chock full of stuff, and to read this would take quite a bit of time. If you look through it, though, you'll find that she's had a lot of experience uh, with uh, the public schools. Uh, and even in mental health, which kind of surprised me just a little bit. And um, one of the, the, the questions that, that I hope someone will ask her is how occupational therapy uh, connects with consumer protection. Uh, but uh, she has a, a pretty interesting uh, story, and uh, I think she has the right vision for this board. So uh, I hope you will uh, take time to get to know her, and I present to you uh, Dr. Amy Stark. Dr. Stark, you heard you heard Senator Moon's question. I'll uh, I'll let you answer that if you would would like to. I think he wants me to talk. I'm fairly passionate about both professional um, landscape here in Missouri, and I'm so proud of what we've done both in the professional fields and through the Missouri Legislature to create um, kind of a just right atmosphere that attracts very qualified healthcare professionals across allied health professions, occupational therapy being one that I'm very passionate about, obviously. And I think that the work that we've recently done in licensure compact law is in tandem with this type of regulatory board, a super innovative and very purposeful step forward in protecting both professionals and their career journeys for licensure and professional practice, but also consumers. And so I see us um, really filling some important 
checks and balances as far as guardrails for professionals that protects consumers through some of these regulatory boards that you're appointing people to today and confirming appointments to today. And I just am grateful to be considered, but also um, very passionate about how important that is for all the people and for thriving healthcare communities. Great, well, well said. Uh, further questions for Dr. Stark? Uh, Senator Esslinger. Just curious because I get to work directly with many educators across our state, and I'm very interested in the alliance piece that I'm seeing happening in, the, in your field uh, with uh, Springfield OTC, Cox uh, Hospital, Cox School of Nursing, all these things. Can you speak to that for just a second just to make the folks aware of what works happening? Absolutely. I'm very excited about that, actually. So as you well probably know, um, Cox Health, Cox College, OTC, Ozarks Technical Community College, Missouri State University, and Springfield School District have all created a new partnership that was recently announced here in September. And to my knowledge, it is the first time that this type of alliance has been created in the United States for this kind of innovative healthcare education idea. And it will provide workforce development pathways starting in high school and will facilitate allied health professional practice from high school all the way through doctorate programs in graduate education. And so it's quite a big endeavor to jump into because you're coordinating in public and private interests. Um, and you are also coordinating accrediting bodies, everything from Higher Learning Commission down to, um, or not down to, across to, all of our K through 12 accreditors. And so it's a lot of things to coordinate, but I think it is the most incredible idea that I've ever heard for healthcare education, and I cannot wait to be a part of it. I share your excitement. It's gonna be good. For the questions for this nominee, seeing none. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for your willingness to serve. Uh, next up, we will hear Deanna Bokel as a member of the Board of Nursing Home Administrators, Senator Schroer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, I am Nick Schroer, Senator for the 2nd Senatorial District. Before you today, to present my constituent, Deanna Bokel of Weldon Spring, who is appointed to the Board of Nursing Home Administrators. Ms. Bokel currently serves as Director of Corporate Compliance with Stonebridge Senior Living. She previously served as Registered Nurse in Acute Medicine in Barnes Jewish Hospital. Ms. Bokel is, licensed, uh, is a licensed nursing home administrator and is board certified in gerontological nursing. She holds a degree in nursing from Barnes Jewish School of Nursing. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Ms. Deanna Bogle. Thank you, Senator Ms. Bogle. Good to have you with us. Questions for this uh, nominee? Senator Moon. Good morning. I, I noticed uh, on the, the either expired or vacant uh, members, does the board require a quorum to do business, as far as you know? Yes. It does? Okay. Is that put you in a pretty bad position, sounds like. Anything you can do independently uh, as your, your service provides to, uh, to make an impact or is it just gonna require waiting until the vacancies are filled? I think right now, and I'm relatively new, but I think right now we have the board positions with the interims um, to have a quorum. Okay. So you can work with some of the expired terms? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Okay, very good. What, what's your, um, as you see it right now, what's your uh, biggest concern uh, or need for uh, the nursing home industry? So I think, um, I, I think the stress that facilities face right now is with um, Medicaid funding and shoring up those um, services that are necessary to be provided 
um, with the seniors that are relying on um, Medicaid to help manage their room and board in um, skilled facilities. For the questions for this nominee, Senator Laughlin. So uh, I'm sort of connected to most of the nursing homes in my district, and I know how, and Senator Moon stole my first question about <laughs> what's the biggest challenge. Um, you are, so I'm really concerned about the future for the nursing homes, particularly in the rural areas. Um, most of them are in very old facilities, and they're very inefficient, you know, utility-wise and in every direction. They don't have the money to replace it. The rates are based on a bizarre formula that only a government could figure out. Um, you know, I advocated for, look, the nursing homes are going to go broke. And, I, and a lot of them, I think, right now are on the very edge of that. Do you feel that that's the case? or? Yes, I, I do feel that's the case. I think the um, profitability margins with Medicare and Medicaid are very slim right now. Um, and I do, we, so Stonebridge Senior Living has um, both urban and rural facilities. So we see, uh, we see all sides of it. So um, the workforce seems to be getting a little better. Um, in the urban areas, we're still struggling workforce. In rural areas and certainly some of the um, facilities that we have in the state are a little older um, and to you know re rehab them to um, come up to you know maybe what the expectations are in 2024 um, is difficult with where funding is right now and so um, the relationship with the department of senior services health and senior services um, sometimes you know, you you have um, a violation in the nursing home, and it seems like the communication back and forth is not all that good. I, and I know on both ends of it, both both entities struggle. But I've seen some really punitive um, punishments of nursing homes, and I'm thinking, gosh, these people are barely hanging on anyway for something that to me seemed relatively small, but. Yes, I, I think there, I think there is a balance in in working with the Department of Health and Senior Services and the surveyors that come into buildings, and and part of that I think is the um, the not the age of the surveyor. I don't mean that, but um, how long they've been practicing, how long they've been in and out of buildings, and right now, when we had um, COVID going on, we really did not have our standard recertification surveys in a lot of buildings. Now, I think the department is coming back into line with getting those completed, but there were facilities that maybe did not have a full survey for a number of months. So you didn't have that full survey team coming in, and then they come in and maybe they're citing to you, as you said, some pettier, some punitive um, types of things, not really taking into consideration maybe the big picture of general resident care and services, individualized care, those types of things. To me, it seems like um, the philosophy is, well, there's not that many people in the rural area, so, you know, everybody just drive and, you know, go to the cities because there are facilities there. but. The reality is that elderly people depend on their family to come and visit them, and the home depends on the family to help really monitor the person and help take care of them. And I think that there should be one, you know, like within 30 miles. If there's not, you can't go visit your relative, and what's the use then? It's just. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and, and we have. Um, some of our rural buildings, um, we're, you know, maybe one of the larger employers in, in that area. And I do think those small town facilities, I, I think it is very important for them to stay intact for all of the reasons that you said. We have buildings where, you know, the staff is taking care of, you know, someone's, I mean, obviously, you know, a friend's grandmother, their aunt, their music teacher, their, I mean, 
it truly is a community hub uh, where people are able to gather, have events, host different social things. Um, I, I think those buildings are very, very important to stay within those rural communities. So I appreciate your willingness to serve. Do you know Libby Yaus? Yes. Yes. She's a friend of mine, and she's from, you know, my home county. I know, so I, know Libby well. I, I look forward to working with you, and I think that we have some issues in the nursing home thing <laughs> we need to address. So thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none. Thank you for being here today. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, next up, we will hear Dorothy Munch, a Democrat, as a member of the State Board of Registration for Healing Arts. Senator Bean. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, Jason Bean, State Senator of the 25th District. I'm here to present for your consideration the governor's appointment of one of my constituents, Dr. Dorothy Munch, from Butler County to the State Board of Registration for the Healing Arts. Dr. Munch works in private practice at Poplar Bluff Wellness Clinic since 2002. She has been practicing medicine in Poplar Bluff community since 1986, starting off as an emergency room physician and now focuses on women's health. She serves as District 10 Counselor for the Missouri State Medical Association. Dr. Munch is also a member of the Board of Trustees for the Butler County Health Department. She has served on the Truman State Board of Governors from 1994 to 2000. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Truman State University, graduating summa cum laude, and earned her doctorate in osteopathic medicine from Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine. A um, couple things. Um, number one, Dr. Munch uh, was delayed in getting up here today because I believe her car broke down, so I appreciate her oh. perseverance in getting here from the Boot Hill because it can be challenging. I left an hour early and ended up an hour late. So, 5 a.m., sorry. All, all is well. Just glad you're here. And for the committee's knowledge, the State Board of Registration for Healing Arts had a board meeting this past Sunday evening, and Dr. Munch voted in favor of repealing the administrative rule which conflicted with the new state's new statute we passed that was signed into law last year. Thank you. Did you get your car situation figured out? Oh, so Doesn't sound fun. Very, very foggy this morning. So 5 a.m. Yeah. I'm dodging deer, and then okay. all of a sudden my car starts jerking. Oh, I'm boy. 60 somewhere near Elsinore. I think probably most of you don't know where, well, you know where that is. So anyway, go back home, get another car. I called Kyle at 6 a.m. Oh, boy. But anyway, hey, I'm here. Great. Thank you very well, we're much. we're glad to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for this nominee, Senator Rizzo. Uh, first of all, thank you for your willingness to serve. And if Senator Bean thinks you're all right, I probably do too. But I really, <clears throat> and and don't worry about being late. Like oh. as senators, no one's late than this group up here. We're all running behind all the time. So I appreciate your slugging it out and getting here. But. Um, I do have a, a question when it re regards to the APRNs and, and the Board of Healing Arts and specifically really and truly catchment areas and in, in, in rural Missouri, uh, people's availability to see uh, medical professionals in rural Missouri and, and if in fact just kind of where you're at on, on that type of stuff because I, a lot of people don't, some people do know, some people don't, but my in-laws live in Jasper, Missouri uh -huh. and it's about 45 minutes for them to see. Uh, a medical professional uh, and, and I really do genuinely care as a Democrat from the city or whatever that yeah. might be called uh, about rural Missourians being able to, to get to see a medical professional when they need to not just not just in a case of an emergency but uh, right. you know w when preventative and all that type of stuff so I just yeah. was curious I, I, yeah I think first and of course I practiced before there were APRNs I go that, go that far sure. back um, I think and I'm independent and I'm solo, so I think I have quite a different perspective than a lot of employed physicians. Um, and I will say I am certainly not anti-APRN. Anti uh, some of my closest friends are sure. nurse practitioners. And um, I, I, at one, I don't have one in my office, I'm, as I said, solo. I, at one point I had decided um, some, uh, an excellent nurse I know finished her um, 
advanced practice degree and I was going to hire her and at that point, and I can't tell you what year it was and I can't tell you why, but there was a moratorium on rural health clinics and so, you know, it, it wasn't, I mean, hiring when you're by yourself, um, hiring a nurse practitioner, which is usually around $100,000 uh, salary, sure. where is, is pretty tough. You got to have the patient, you got to have the um, um, office staff, et cetera. So where I am and what I see, and I'll be very blunt because I really answer, answer to no one, um, mm -hmm. being independent, what worries me um, um, probably more than anything. Um, so one of my biggest referral patterns is an hour and a half away. Um, and that's where there's, uh, in, in the town I live, um, there aren't many subspecialists. We have a few, um, but um, I refer um, uh, about an hour and a half away. So my patients are, are driving. And I think what I'm seeing, and it, and it does trouble me, and, I, and, I, and once again, I, I, I work hard not to be biased. I and mean, I don't think I am biased in saying this, but um, I'm in situations where I've seen patients now, um, I know I don't look 64, but I am. <laughs> so no, I've seen no, no. patients for decades. Um, and, you know, so I have, uh, I, and I'll give you a case in point. I have an 80 year old lady with bad aortic stenosis, and she's doing okay. A lot of family support, um, which is really important for the elderly. And she goes once a year uh, to see a cardiologist. Well, her cardiologist left. And so when we called to schedule her for her yearly visit, you know, they do an echo. They look at the aortic valve size. You know, I was told, my receptionist was told, you know, the family nurse practitioner will see her. No, no. You know, I, she's my patient. I'm a family practitioner. As it, as it, and once again, I'm, I'm not being negative about sure. that FNP because I like her. She just finished school. She's not a cardiologist. Yeah. Um, and and um, several... Probably the majority of my referrals uh, right now to the closest um, large hospital um, um, are going, like if I send to ortho, if I send to neurosurgery, if I send to um, cardiology at, at a particular institution, um, are seeing a nurse practitioner is kind of the first visit. Then they drive back an hour and a half and see the specialist. And, and, and frankly, I see that as hospitals maximizing visits um, and utilization. Sure. But, and, and don't get me wrong, there's an absolute place um, for, to extend those people, okay? Mm -hmm. But, um, and so I think nurse practitioners, and, and as I said, I know several, and I think the critical piece to it is the degree of supervision. Um, I agree. I, and, and I'll give you one more vignette because I think it just speaks to it. So I had a patient um, that I sent to a dermatology office in town. She had a lesion on her face and I do skin, I do some skin, um, but it was a cosmetic area and I thought, well, I'd really let the dermato rather have the dermatologist do it. Um, so she ended up, um, or the, the procedure was done by a family nurse practitioner, not the dermatologist to whom I referred the patient. Um, interestingly, and, and I really like this gentleman, he's a personal friend of mine, you know, she, she came back from the derm visit and said, well, so-and-so said to tell you hello, and I'm like, well, you were supposed to see Dr. So-and-so, now I saw so-and-so. Two months later, Another patient came back from an endocrinologist. She has thyroid nodules, so she sure. goes once a year to see the endocrinologist. So two months later, another patient came back and said, well, Dr. So-and-so says to tell you hello. And I said, that's, that's not your endocrinologist. It was the same nurse practitioner who three months prior had been in a derm office, now in an endocrinology office, who had a doctorate now, a DNP. Sure. Okay, so a DNP is a doctorate, you know, um, so I think that being a, a, a pretty, and I'm not by any means a, a, a wonderful doctor. I miss things. You know what I'm saying? I'm not perfect. You must be pretty means, good to get here. I will say that. <laughs> but when you practice 37 years, you know a little bit, you know, and, and you know your patients. So I think in answer to your question, I don't see nurse practitioners. I'm sorry. I, I've kind of come back. Okay. I'll come back to it. I don't see them going to the places of need. I see the I see more utilization of them by um, hospitals. And I have I'll give you one more vignette, and then I'll stop with the vignettes. So I sent a patient a couple weeks ago to a general surgeon. He's got an inguinal hernia, 
And so, um, and, and he's diabetic, and I wanted to make sure his, his sugars were under control before he went to surgery. And so I sent a very nice surgeon I sent him to, and he came back, he's a very nice patient. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, how'd your visit go? It, how'd you like Dr. So-and-so? Well, I didn't meet Dr. So-and-so. I saw the nurse practitioner. I said, well, when will you meet Dr. So-and-so? I guess on the day of my surgery. That makes me uncomfortable. Uh, sure. I, I, it just does. So I think how we, how, we, how we get, you know, how we get care in, um, you know, in, in rural Missouri, if you want to, you know, you want to know what scares me about rural Missouri, the loss of Ellington Hospital, the loss of I Donovan agree. Hospital, the loss of Kennett Hospital. Yep. You know, I'd love to, sorry, I'm a little... <laughs> you're sorry. fine. It's been a rough morning. No, uh, no. And and I, I, yeah, and I will say, I, I agree with what you're saying. I kind of yeah. get the general idea, and that's that's yeah. why I think yeah. the the Board of Healing Arts, and, and it's important to put people on there that are understanding yeah. uh, some of the need yeah. that's that's Absolutely. going unnoticed in rural Missouri. Yeah. And, and that's where we need people. Yeah. You know, we need people out in these rural areas, yeah. but they need to be, by the, by the same token, they need that, in my strong opinion, they need that collaboration. I'm sorry, I'm drawing oh, you're out. Fine. Because, you know, it doesn't matter how long you've practiced, even if you know your medicine cold, and I don't pre pretend to, if you know your medicine cold, there's always that patient that something presents differently. Sure. There's always your complainers that complain about lots of things, and there's your stoic elderly that won't complain if they're bleeding out. You yeah. Know? So it's, it's the practice of medicine's not. There you go. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Gentlemen. Well, thank no, you. I, I appreciate I appreciate your willingness to serve. The only thing that I would do is uh, encourage the the Board of Healing Arts to have a a, a good respect and partnership with the legislature. And uh, you know, when we pass some stuff, I hope that they will respect that. And, yeah, and, and I think you know. I mean, from my standpoint, I'm not an attorney. You sure. Know, and and I think that that was the hard part is we perceived something um, that apparently wasn't by the letter of the law. And so I think that I will say, and I've, I've been to only, I've, been to, I've done two teleconferences and one in-person meeting, and I will assure all of you that the people on this board are good people. They are very good people. They are, okay, they are, have no doubt. And they're well-meaning people, and they wanna do what's best for patients. And I do think that part of that is maintaining you know, uh, the credibility um, and maintaining, you know, you, the practice of medicine, you have to work hard to do it well. And, you know, um, I think putting people who aren't um, trained in positions where they need more training, um, and, and frankly, in, in some aspects, to help the, fi the bottom line financially, and I will just say that. I don't, you know, once again, I don't owe anybody anything. Sure. I, I, you know, I don't answer to anyone but myself. So Thanks. that's what you guys have to watch is the, the um, utilization of them that's not helpful to the healthcare system. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Further questions for the nominee? And sorry, I didn't sing, mean to be verbose. Sing, hey. We let anybody whose car breaks down talk for a long time, <laughs> especially when they come from. I didn't hit a deer. Especially when they come from Arkansas. Almost. Almost. Pretty close. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you bet. You so much. Uh, we'll go back to Senator Shore. My apologies, Senator uh, Joan uh, DeLeo. Joan DeLeo is a member of the Missouri Wine and Grape Board. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the committee, Nick Schroer again from the second senatorial district, St. Charles County. Before you today to present my constituent, Joan DeLeo of O'Fallon. She was appointed to the Missouri Wine and Grape Board. And I think at this time, uh, with everything happening in politics, what better way to uh, kind of relax than some good Missouri wine? Ms. DeLeo currently serves as the president and CEO of Old Time Produce, Inc. She further serves on the Greater STL Chairman's Council, the Chamber STL Committee, and Harvest Sensations Board of Managers. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Reed College and a Master of Business Administration from Wash U. It is my pleasure to introduce you to my friend, Joan DeLeo. Thank you, Senator. Mr. DeLeo, thanks for being here today. Questions for this nominee? Senator Moon. Good morning, Mr. DeLeo. 
Uh, easy said, question. No questions. Have, have you ever had a muscadine grape? Yes. <clears throat> Thoughts? Well, you don't see them much anymore. That's an old grape. Yeah. Used to thick, be people thick. would bring them into the market, mm -hmm. like in the old, on the old produce row, which really isn't really a market anymore. It's more a distribution hub. But uh, you would see those kinds of grapes. Um, I wish they grew more. They were cool. As I understand it, there is a um, a cultivar that's been developed for Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, you, when I grew up in North Carolina, they were my grandpa's fence row. We would go mm -hmm. and, and eat them. They're always seeded, though. Have you ever seen that's a seed? That's right, and yeah. that's partly why you don't see them so much anymore. Yeah. But it was really cool grape. You kind of, you know, squeezed it uh -huh. and, and, and ate the inside and, of course, yeah. spit out the seeds. <laughs> Does anyone make wine out of that, you suppose? You know, I think the old Italians did. The old Italians? The old Italians oh, did, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. Some of my past relatives, quasi-bootleggers. Yeah. You know, they had a little bathtub program uh -huh. going. Good deal. <laughs> All right, thank you. Further questions? Seeing none. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for your willingness thank you. to serve. Uh, next up, we will hear uh, Dr. Kishore Kott. I hope I said that close to right. Uh, as a member of the Mental Health Commission, Coat, uh, Senator Rader, Senator Thompson Rader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Senator Holly Thompson Rader from the 27th down in Southeast Missouri. And it is my honor to present to you Dr. Cott. And I want to tell you just a little bit about him because I don't know that he'll um, brag on himself the way that I would like to. He has really um, made a big difference in Southeast Missouri with mental health. And y'all know that's a big, super big deal for me. He is a board certified psychiatrist with over 24 years of experience working with patients of all ages at an outpatient mental health clinic in SEMO. After completing medical school in India and his residency in psych psychiatry in New York, he went on to complete a fellowship in geriatric psychiatry at the University of Florida. Dr. Cope planned to work in a mental health underserved area for just three years. He came to Missouri in 2000 to do that. However, he and his family fell in love with the state and decided to make it a home where he would continue his practice. For us, he sees children, adults, and the elderly at the outpatient clinic at the Community Counseling Center in Cape. Over the years, he's also worked in the center's outpatient mental health clinics in Perryville, St. Genevieve, Marble Hill, and Fredericktown. He has also worked in the inpatient unit at Southeast Health, now Mercy Hospital, for over 10 years. Dr. Cope believes that advocating for policies which raise everyone's awareness and help in early identification, intervention, and support of individuals with mental illness and developmental disabilities is a fundamental part of his commitment as a psychiatrist. So it is my honor to present Dr. Cope. Fantastic. Thank you, Senator Rader. Uh, th glad to have you here today. Questions for Zoni. Senator Olafson. Could you open a clinic up here? Because we, we need some of your <laughs> services. <laughs> Seriously. <Thank you. laughs> I'm not joking here. We, we, no. found, we need mental health professionals and elevator safety people. Yes, That's what we need in, in the Missouri Senate. <laughs> Thank you. And now yeah, probably in that order, actually. I, I Senator do want to, I do want to say that I did also drive up from southeast Missouri last night in the fog and rain. Thankfully, my car did not break down. Okay, perfect. Good. Well, we're not going to let you talk very long then. So I'm just joking. Senator Moon. Yeah, uh, Dr. Coat uh, visited me earlier this morning. I've got, I've got dibs on the practice down there, so... 220. Uh, Dr. Cote, you, we had a pretty good conversation earlier today, and uh, I thought your, uh, your view on medications and patients and the relationship was very interesting. Would you want to share 
what your your philosophy is on that? Yes. Uh, so I've been working in uh, a mental health underserved area now for 24 years. I'm probably the only, one of the very few, I would say, uh, in-person psychiatrist who sees people face to face, children, adults, and the elderly in a mental health underserved area. I've done that for 24 years. And my focus has been medication management. And that's what I do day in and day out. But like we're talking about, what I find also that medications are not always the answer. And if you can find ways and advocate for programs which can help actually uh, early diagnosis and prevention of these issues, then we can reduce the need for medications. Uh, I find a lot of people are on medications for a long, long time. And ultimately, they come up with long, big lists. And part of my diagnosis and evaluation is to try, try and find out, you know, does the patient really need to be on so many medications? Can I reduce the burden on these on the medications? Especially with psychiatric patients, they get on more and more and more and more medicines, and nobody takes the time to try and reduce it. You know, de-prescribing is so much harder than prescribing. So it's very easy to prescribe medications. A little bit more complex to try and uh, reduce the, you know, to de-prescribe. So that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, but that was what I was uh, talking to you about this morning. Thank you. Further questions for this nominee? Seeing none. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for making the drive. Thank you so much. And next up, we will hear Maddox Stuttered as a member of the Missouri Southern State University Board of Governors, Senator Carter. Anytime. Um, Mr. Chairman, committee members, I'm just, it's a privilege to meet. This is actually the first time I've met Maddox. Um, I got the news that he was appointed to be the representative, student representative for um, the Board of Governors for MSSU. And I had a note in my office ready to send him, so I got to meet him for the first time actually today. So he is currently a sales professional at Frank Fletcher Toyota. He currently attends Missouri Southern State University, go Lions and is pursuing a, a bachelor's in business administration and with an emphasis on finance. Beyond his work and school, he is involved in the following um, MOSO CAPS alumni, National Honor Society, Brother to Brother, Steering Committee member, Future Business Leader of America member, and the Golden Lion Award winner. He's also a member of the Joplin Area Chamber of Commerce, and I couldn't be more proud to be here today with him to put you before put him before you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Um, good to have you with us. Just give us uh, maybe a couple sentences of uh, how you think you can um, be of benefit as the student representative uh, on, on the Board of Governors. And so, I'm really excited for this role for the Board of Governors and a passion of mine has always been able to speak out for people who have, don't have a voice and so with the students I'd love to be able to speak on behalf of their concerns or any changes that they desire or need for the campus. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your patience. Last but not least, we will hear Charles Bryant as a member of the Public School Retirement System, Missouri Board of Trustees, Senator McCreary.
I think my constituent, Mr. Bryant, should win an award for patience because he has stuck with the senator with the least amount of seniority in this building. So it is my great honor to present my constituent from Creve Corps, Mr. Charles Bryan. I think he likes to be called Chuck, quite honestly. Um, I am, I was impressed with, with Chuck when I met him, uh, probably via email, first of all. Um, I wish all Missourians were as eager to volunteer for the state and um, put their life experience to work in, in a volunteer capacity. So um, Chuck has 30 years of institutional investment experience. Um, professionally, he just really has an understanding of all the challenges facing public pension funds, which I think is a pretty unique gift that he will be bringing to the PSRS board. Um, and I think one of the reasons I'm so comfortable supporting him is he has served on this board before, and so he knows what he's getting into. He knows about the workload um, and all the things that go with this kind of volunteer community service. So I'm honored to support Mr. Bryant, and I'm sure he would be eager to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Bryant, thank you for being here. Thanks for your patience. Uh, for the questions for Mr. Bryant. Senator Moon. Good morning, Mr. Bryant. Thank morning, you for sir. being willing to take on this. Um, there are several funds that need help. Will you lend your expertise to those <laughs> as well? Um, uh, that, that, that was not a, that was just rhetorical. But uh, how much should we divest of the uh, of the program? And that's rhetorical too. That's the, we have one of the. I, sh I should quit. We have one of the the best retirement programs for teachers, uh, I think, nationwide, and um, uh, and I, I hope that um, you'll be able to advocate as you probably already are uh, in the future and um, present to us who are on the board uh, uh, in the Senate in the House to um, maybe take some advice I, I think though more we are hands off on that one particularly we're in good shape but on, on a serious note if you had some offline comments on for some of these other funds uh, there are some in some serious need and um, Anyway, that being said, is it, what, what would you like for us to know about you other than what Senator McCurry has already told us? Well, I've spent my uh, professional life, uh, part of my job is business development, and I learned a long time ago that uh, if you've made the sale, shut up. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm here at your disposal, and um, I'm certainly looking. This, I will say that uh, I have, you know, I've been doing this, uh, I've worked for my, I started as an intern for my firm in St. Louis in 1994. Uh, been there a long time, I've been doing this a long time, and the vast majority of my work has been with public funds. Mm. And that's the biggest chunk of our client base at my firm are public funds, public pension funds. Um, I believe in the public pension, if they are managed uh, properly, and responsibly, I think public pension funds are an asset to society. This is like for our teachers, our, our police officers, our firefighters. Um, I feel like we have a sort of a handshake uh, a contract with them. Th this is not my, I'm, I'm married to a fifth grade public school teacher, so I care about this. Um, you, this is not, uh, being a public servant is not, obviously you don't get extravagantly wealthy. And I feel like the uh, exchange for that is we should, we can provide you with a, a solid, safe retirement. And I think that's a good deal for both sides. And also how we recruit good teachers. A big part of the recruitment of quality educators is knowing that they're going to have a solid retirement. And to your point, um, I, I am, again, I have a lot of experience and I've dealt with a lot of public funds. Uh, PSRS Peers is an extraordinary organization, and I was privileged to serve on it before, and I, am, I feel very privileged to have the opportunity to do it again. It's a way for me to give back uh, to an industry that's been very good to me. So I don't know if that's helpful. Further questions? Sarah Singer. I would just like an opportunity to visit with you. I have a couple of ideas, which, of course, I would like to, to share with you one is in regards to what the workforce now with the shortage in teachers is trying to uh, entice or bring back retired folks into the fold so that they can provide quality programs while we get more teachers into the guy to the pipeline and then the second thing is is that when you look at our various retirement programs whether it's Moser's or whatever it is 
how do you marry up the profession with, uh, let's say, the department? For instance, if you have a, a, a high-flying educator and they're part of PSRS, but you would like to entice them to work in other areas of our state, they will not because they are, de they are totally dedicated to the service that they have related to PSRS. So even though it's the same kind of work and the same kind of opportunity, which actually they have more opportunity for impact, they will not jump because they have to put the 25 or the 80 plus or whatever it is, but you're losing talent. And I think that that's something that you and I can have a conversation about. Yeah, fair enough. It's, um, so I think what you're alluding to is if, if I'm a teacher with 15 years in and I had an opportunity to go serve in another, mm -hmm. in the public sector, I can't take that and go, yeah. take my pension and go to Mozart's. It's not potable. Um, the, I think the complexities of that would be pretty significant because you're in a pool of money. So I would tell you that I am not smart enough to know how to do that. But conceptually, uh, it would be great if, again, we have people who are willing to serve and they don't get that, you know, again, my wife is sort of locked into her school district. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I've talked to her, I'm like, why don't, you know, you could go do, and she said, I, I, I'm kind of stuck here. Yeah. I'm stuck in this system. Yeah. I can't really go anywhere. Yeah. For, I mean, all, in all of our state agencies, obviously, as, as you, there's opportunity for talent for them to be of service in other places, but because of those pieces, and not just education, but I would like to have a conversation. I don't want to take up the, the committee's time with that, but we can talk later. Thank Fair you. Fair enough. Love to. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Again, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Senators. I would make a motion that we move into executive session. Moving and seconded. All those in favor say aye. aye. Let's both say no. We are in executive session. Uh, I would make a motion that we uh, roll the entirety of the uh, slate that we heard, uh, the members that we heard today into one slate. Moved and seconded discussion on that motion. All in favor say aye. As opposed to say no. We have a slate before us, and I would now move that that slate vote do pass to the Senate floor. Moved and seconded discussion on that motion. Chris, call the roll. Aye. By your vote of 10-0, you voted that slate due pass to the Senate floor. Make a motion that we move out of executive session and adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. We are adjourned.